when he came into the world in the humiliation of the Incarnation, he started on a route of conquest. They took him through the lonely years until the time that he was introduced in the muddy waters of Jordan as the bony prophet-like finger of John the Baptist was pointed at him and those significant words were uttered, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. For some thirty-three and a half years he overcame and lived an impeccable life so that it can be said of him that he was tempted in all points like as we, yet without sin. His impeccable life was followed by a decisive death as he went to Calvary to endure inexplicable and incomparable sufferings, sufferings that we can only have a hint of, sufferings that we can only look at curiously and sometimes with a sob in our throat, sufferings that are veiled in the mystery of the bearing of sin, sufferings that are surrounded by torn rocks and a sun that will refuses to shine and an earth that writhes in an agony as he hangs there alone and God reaches down his giant fist and gathers the accumulated sins of men and places it upon him and he becomes the sin center of the universe so that it could be said of him he was made sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him in the awful loneliness of Calvary he made his soul an offering for sin and the sin of the world was placed upon him and the bolts of God's wrath were released upon him and he became an offering for sin and he gave up the ghost and he came down from the mystery of his sufferings having finished the work what men saw was a man hanging limp every bone out of joint a swollen tongue protruding from burning lips as he cried out it is finished they didn't know what was going on but the veil of revelation is drawn back and we're told by Paul that something was going on in the darkness of that awful hour. He was tying a chain around the neck of the demonic world. He was dragging them across the stage of the cosmos and the Bible said that he was destroying principalities and powers and making a show of them openly, triumphing over them in his cross. He was dealing with sin. He was dealing with the old Adamic society. He was making an end of an old order. And when he had done it in the mystery of his cross, he said it is finished. And then he went down to make his announcement. The Bible says, or the creed says, rather, he descended into hell or Hades. I'm not going to take time to document all of these things or enter into argument about them. But I believe that he went down and through the authority of what he had just accomplished at Calvary, he confronted his satanic majesty as he stood at the portals of the world of Hades. And he said to him, I'll take the keys. <laughs> Satan says, I've been waiting for you for about 4,000 years. He said, I was there in the Garden of Eden. I was the one that got that rap. I was the one that was told that somebody was going to come along and crush my head. And I've been waiting for you, and I've been killing people off all along the historical line because I thought they were the one. But here you are, now in there with the rest of them. They're all in there. Who was in there? Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Isaiah and Malachi, they were all in paradise. In fact, just before our Lord had gone to his cross, they come up on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elias, and they had a conversation. They talked to the Lord. 
And the Bible tells us what they talked about. They spake of his decease that was soon to be accomplished in Jerusalem. And they said, everybody's excited down in paradise. There's great excitement down there, Mashiach. We, we want to kind of tell you that we, we've been appointed a committee to come up and tell you that, that, that everything's, all, everything's all astir down there. Man, when we left, Isaiah wanted to come. He said, that this is the greatest day. I wrote about this, and, and, and now it's coming to pass. He said, Abraham, he was right behind. He, he, he wanted to come too, but we were appointed to come and tell you that we're so grateful for what you're doing. There are thousands of them down there. Everything's all astir. Why? Because under the old covenant, the blood of bulls and of goats couldn't take away sin. There were men down in paradise clenching in their fists their credit notes, for they were down there there with promissory notes. And every time an Israelite laid his hands on a lamb and transmitted his sins, that that lamb may die in his place, that at best was a credit note to be redeemed by the most precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they were waiting for the time when their credit notes would be redeemed. And now this is the time. And so he comes down from his cross and he confronts his satanic majesty. And he says, I'll take those keys. And Satan said, no one's ever talked to me like this. <laughs> and Jesus said, no one ever had the authority to. But he said, as God's king, as the one who has now been given authority as his delegated sovereign i'm in charge now i'll take the keys and satan handed him the key and he went over into the unrighteous section and he opened the door and he looked in and he had pronounced that they had been righteously judged for having rejected god's counsel under an old economy and he shut the door and left them there and then he turned to the gate of paradise and he opened it and he said, come on, let's go. They started up the steps of ascension and when it got as far as Jerusalem, some of those Old Testament saints said, Master, do you mind if we have a stopover ticket? We'd like to spend a few hours in the old hometown. We haven't seen it for centuries. And the Bible says that the bodies of many of the saints were seen in the streets of Jerusalem. Having looked at the old hometown, they continued with their journey. And up and up and up they went until they came in sight of the ramparts of glory. And then this great crowd of Old Testament redeemed who were moving paradise into better quarters cried out. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. But it's not that easy, for angelic protectors hurl back their challenge over the ramparts of glory, and they say, Who is this King of glory? They said, Let's tell him. He is the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. He is the one who has just come freshly from the battlefields of Golgotha, where single-handedly he dealt a death blow to all of Satan's plans and purposes, where single-handedly he bore the sins of men, where single-handedly he cut off the old Adamic order, where single-handedly he died a decisive death, meeting the demands of God, meeting the requirements of man. He is the Lord of hosts, mighty in battle. Now will you lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. And again, unsettled satisfied they reply who is this king of glory and they cry back he is the lord of hosts he is the king of glory he is the one who is in charge of all the angelic hosts but not only that he 
is the king now of a multitude which no man can number. He is God's delegated authority. He is the one who is to bring to God the fruit of his purposes. He is the king of glory. Now swing back those gates and let the king of glory come in. And the gates swing back and he enters in, steps up to the father's throne, presents the tokens of his redemption. And the father said, sit down, son, at my right hand and reign until thine enemies are made thy footstool.